Good morning. My name is Melanie Bresnan. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the temporary music coordinator here at First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. Please rise, embody your in spirit, and join in singing our morning song, number 212 in our gray hymnal, We Are Dancing Sarah's Circle. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Diane Daugert. My pronouns are she and her, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to worship with the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. On Sunday mornings, we bring our whole selves, our many names for the divine, our diverse spiritual paths, and join together in worship. As Unitarian Universalists, we do not share a common creed, but covenant together to affirm our interdependence, celebrate our differences, and work for justice. We are a welcoming congregation, and we deepen our relationships as we serve the congregation's mission to create community, nurture spiritual growth, act on our values in the broader world, Guided by, love, guided by reason and inspired by love. Together, we work to confront oppression, promote environmental and social justice. I would like to extend a special welcome to anyone who may be visiting with us for the first time, either here in the sanctuary or joining us by Zoom. Wherever, whoever you are, whatever brought you here today, wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. 
If you'd like to learn more about Unitarian Universalism or how to become involved in the life of the congregation, you can reach out to our student minister, Danielle Garrett, and you can find her contact information on our website. And just a couple short announcements. The board is hosting a community conversation about the church music ministry today, Sunday, April 10th, in the sanctuary and on Zoom, 15 minutes after this service ends, to discuss what we want from our music ministry program in search for a more permanent music director. This is a good time to rethink our music ministry. As we know, we have been blessed with Melanie Bresnan working in a temporary capacity, but we'll soon be getting a search for someone to fill a, a fuller position. And you can also fill out a survey online. And for the Zoom link and the survey, you can find that link also on the website. And for details about all of the other announcements, as we begin to get back to the fullness of the life of this congregation, you can find all the announcements in the bulletin that you're handed here in the sanctuary, or you can find them, as always, on the website. We are so glad you have joined us for worship. Hello, my name is River Plummer and my pronouns are he, they. The words for the chalice lighting were written by Deborah Falk. The chalice lit among us is a beacon, a beacon of hope in a world of crisis, a beacon of possibility made manifest in community, a beacon of warmth through our interconnections, a beacon of light illuminating our shared wisdom a beacon of connection by our being together. It is often said that ministers are here to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. I say we are all afflicted and we are all comfortable. May our time together this morning be a comfort and a confrontation. May we find here peace in times of tumult. May we invite tumult into the peace of our lives. May here we find calm in times of restlessness. May here we allow restlessness to evolve into action. Let this be a place you consider what you've never considered. Let this be the place you imagine for yourself something new and unthinkable. May this hour bring dreams of new ways of being in the world. Let us prepare ourselves for worship. Come, let us worship.
Hello? Okay. Universalist Clara Barton, one of our most famous foremothers, was a distinguished leader of her day. Noted for organizing nursing services and supplies for soldiers during the Civil War, she was also the founder of the American Red Cross and actively involved in that organization until she was well into her 80s. In order to both honor her example and celebrate today's women, the UU Women's Federation <laughs> created and maintains the Clara Barton Sisterhood. Lori Riddle is being inducted into the Clara Barton Sisterhood today. Lori joined the Unitarian Universalist Church of Kent, Ohio in 1966. She has continued since then with active memberships at churches in Brunswick, Maine, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and now here at the First UU Church of Nashville, Tennessee. Lori is being honored in part for 46 years of dedicating countless hours to expanding the UU Fellowship of Indiana, Pennsylvania through the stages of obtaining a part-time and then a full-time minister. She was pivotal as co-chair of the Capitol Campaign and integrally involved with the Building Committee as the church worked through a multi-year process of visioning, funding, and finally completing its own building. Lori served as the pianist, contributing to the religious education program and was central in many of the church's social action projects. Lori and her husband, Bob, raised children, Keith and Bethany, in the church in Pennsylvania. When Lori and Bob moved to Nashville, she quickly became involved at First UU Nashville, joining two other generations of her family there. The involvement of their daughter, Bethany Riddle Johnson, Bethany's husband, Josh, and their daughters, Maya and Gwendolyn, reflect the lifelong commitment that Lori has shown towards strengthening our denomination. At FUN, Lori's active membership includes the choir, a shared ministry group, and the book group. She also shares her talents with FUN as a substitute pianist, adding beautiful music to Sunday services. Lori has played the piano since she was a child, briefly majoring in piano performance at college and continuing to play in the Monday Music Club and for various church events. She earned her bachelor's degree from Lebanon Valley College and her master's of social work from the University of Pittsburgh. Lori carried her UU principles into a strong career in mental health services, working as a therapist at a domestic violence shelter and subsequently leading a mental health team for the Social Services Agency of Cambria County, Pennsylvania. After her retirement, Lori became a Red Cross disaster mental health volunteer helping families who survived fires and tornadoes in Pennsylvania, as well as Hurricane Katrina in Mississippi. Among her social action projects while in Pennsylvania, Lori helped found a pollution solution group, pursuing grant money and volunteer participation to addressing recycling and solid waste disposal. She was also a founding member of her local chapter of the League of Women Voters and served as a local representative to her state Democratic Party. Lori was named a notable woman in 2008 by the American Association of University Women and received a Fearless Diamond Award from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, honoring her leadership, accomplishments, and commitment to social justice and diversity. In 2012, she was named Female Civic Leader of the Year by the Leader Circle of Indiana County, Pennsylvania. We are proud today to include Lori into the sisterhood of notable Unitarian Universalist women. We thank you for all of your incredible contributions to the faith. Congratulations, Lori.
I'm Susan Johnston, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm here to talk about stewardship. Okay, I've not been a member for 44 years like Randy Weeks has, but I, I feel like I've always been a UU. When I came here, I don't know, somewhere in the last 20 years, um, I just felt like this was my place. I came for Sunday worship services, and they really fed me. I had an emotional reaction, and my mind was challenged. And then I went to an adult RE class, and it was even more my kind of thing. I felt like I could really get my teeth into the discussion that people were having that evening. I joined a covenant group. Lori's a member of it. <laughs> and it's a wonderful group of women who are so close to each other and we share so deeply. I've come to really care so much about those women and about so many of the people in this congregation. I've enjoyed working with social justice here and I'm proud that that's a big part of this congregation and our identity in the community, the larger community. And then there's the fun stuff. There's dinners for nine, and there's picnics, and there's Wednesday night dinners, and there's um, auction. Vicki and I go in next weekend to uh, spend the weekend in Chattanooga because of a contribution that the Pasto Crosby's made to the auction. Um, and then the next weekend, we have the herb fair, and it goes on and on. I appreciate so many things about this community. And um, as I thought about all those things, I realized those are all part of stewardship. And the time and the energy and the enthusiasm and the money that it takes are things that we all need to commit to. So I hope if you haven't already done so, that you'll consider what your commitment's gonna be for the coming year. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hackett. My pronouns are she and her. You may know that we share every Sunday's collection with an organization whose work outside our walls aligns with our values. Share the Plate for April is NOAA, Nashville Organized for Action and Hope, an anti-racist faith-based coalition that is multiracial, multigenerational, and interfaith comprised of congregations, community organizations, and labor unions that work to amplify the power of ordinary people. Offerings made by placing them in the offering bowls as they circulate through the sanctuary, and as always, donations can be made online at any time. The offering is a sacrament of the free church. It is supported by the voluntary generosity of all who join with us. As always, your gifts, like your presence among us, are received with gratitude.
when we come to worship, we are invited to bring our whole selves, including struggles and difficulties, joys and celebrations, knowing that whatever we bring, it will be held in community. As we continue to learn new ways of gathering and connecting from many locations, we're experimenting with different ways of doing this important element of worship in this congregation. And so for today, we'll continue with the lifting of names of those that we wish to hold in the warm embrace of community. And as always, you can reach out to your lay ministers at any time for support during the week, and you can find their contact information on the church website. For today, I invite us first into a time of silent reflection, a time to listen to what it is that's in your heart and on your mind. The sound of the bell will bring your attention back to the room, and then you'll be invited to speak the names of people that you are holding in tender care today. The name you speak may be your own. And if you are on Zoom, you may type names into the chat, and they will be spoken aloud into the sanctuary by someone here. Let us enter a time of shared silence. Let us lift the names of those that we would like to be held in the warm embrace of this community. Let us pray. Spirit of life and spirit of love, God of many names and beyond naming, draw near to all those named here today and those unnamed, but no less in need of your presence. Let us all feel the power of this gathered community as we renew our mutual covenant of love and care. O oh God of mercy, our hearts are troubled by the devastations of war. We pray that as a people we may find our way to peace, the peace that is more than the cessation of war, but is the presence of shalom, an act of peace that brings about wholeness and justice. O oh God of compassion, May those among us who are experiencing difficulty find comfort, hope, and solidarity, knowing they do not struggle on their own. Life brings joy as surely as it brings sorrow, and so we grieve with those who mourn and celebrate with those who feel blessed by the sweetness of life's gift. May the power of this gathered community surround and sustain us this day and all the days to come. 
In the name of all that is holy, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in singing number 123 in our gray hymnal, Spirit of Life. We'll sing it once through. be seated. And before I begin today, I want to add my words of congratulations to Lori Riddle for the achievement of the incredible award and a reminder of how it is that when we come together as a congregation, it is the people that make everything that happens here happen here. And Lori's receiving of that award is testament to the commitment and dedication that it takes from everyone to make a congregation. So congratulations, Lori. I'm so glad to know you. I begin today with two short readings. The first one is by Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan priest and founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation. He writes, as people become more afraid and insecure, they do not know how to access their own soul, move to prayer, or toward their better instincts. At that point, the easy and comforting response is to quote scripture, some authority, or some legal principle. It takes away one's anxiety rather quickly. The fundamentalist is more than anything else one who believes that all problems can be resolved by an appeal to authority. No inner life is necessary, no faith journey, no actual experience. Someone else can do all my homework for me. I do not need to take responsibility for my own life. Someone higher will, they seem to say. The second reading is by the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore, who is a member of the Unitarian Universalist Association's Commission on Institutional Change. She writes, the power of the individual member of our congregation and covenanted community is best held with humility. We are asked to recognize that our power is shared with other individuals and with those called as partnership, called as partners in leadership within our communities. This is the dance of congregationalism, sharing leadership, 
recognizing when individuals are in a best position to lead or move back, and making space for new ideas, change, and transformation. Here end the readings. When our religious ancestors on American soil broke away from the Church of England, they were left with some questions about how to organize themselves as a church without the rule of monarchs and bishops. Their questions were essentially these. By what authority do we establish a church? And by what authority do we ordain our ministers? These religious ancestors of ours were a lot like us. As they wrestled with these questions, they met weekly in people's homes to discuss the questions and to discern answers together. What came out of those discussions was the Cambridge Platform, a document that outlines the theological basis for the organization and governance of churches under what we know today as congregational polity. In short, the answer to these two questions was essentially the same. The authority of the gathered community and the spirit that moves within it. So the authority to gather a church and the authority to ordain ministers comes from the gathered community and the spirit that moves within it. The authority for all matters pertaining to the congregation resides not with monarchs and bishops, not even with the minister, but with the congregation gathered in the spirit of covenant. Fast forward nearly 400 years since the Cambridge Platform was written in 1648, and we still operate under congregational polity, recognizing the authority that exists within the gathered community. And while Congregational polity is a hallmark of Unitarian Universalism. It isn't unique to us. Other churches that are organized this way are the American Baptists and the Church of Christ, to name just a couple. Reverend Fenimore, whose words I read earlier, says there is a dance to Congregationalism sharing leadership by sometimes stepping up and sometimes stepping back, leading at times and following at others. You could say it is the dance of authority. I'm reminded here of the time when my husband AJ and I took dance lessons. Has anybody here ever taken dance lessons? You may recognize some of this. We did most of our growing up in the 60s, a time when everyone was being encouraged to do their own thing. So we learned the style of dance that is more like two people flailing their bodies at each other than like a couple dancing together. In our younger years, AJ and I loved to dance. And over time, as we went out dancing, we started to be jealous of the people who could actually dance together, gliding gracefully across the floor, whirling and twirling together. So we decided to take dance lessons. We particularly like jazz, blues, and big band music. So we decided to take swing lessons. If you're a beginner, I don't recommend that. Not the place to start. But at that first class, the instructor taught us the basic steps and then set us loose to try it on our own. We were having a great time until the instructor tapped AJ on the shoulder and told him there were some things he needed to learn about leading. Now, 
This instructor clearly didn't understand that ours was an egalitarian relationship, not ruled by stereotypical gender roles. Surely there had to be another way to do this, a way that was more in keeping with our relationship values. The instructor listened politely and then told us that either AJ had to learn how to lead or we had to drop the class. <laughs> we really wanted to learn to dance together, so dutifully, AJ went with the instructor and learned how to lead. At the next lesson, we learned a few more steps and dance moves, and then the instructor set us off on our own again. AJ was exerting some leadership, and we thought we were getting the hang of it until the instructor tapped me on the shoulder and told me that there were some things I needed to learn about following. <laughs> now, clearly, this instructor did not understand that I was a strong, capable woman who didn't need a man to lead her anywhere. The instructor listened politely and then politely told me that I would either have to learn to follow or drop the class. Begrudgingly, I went off with the instructor to learn how to follow. At the third lesson, we're nothing if not tenacious. <laughs> At the third lesson, the instructor reviewed what we had learned so far and then set us off on our own to practice. AJ was uncomfortable leading and I was uncomfortable following. We tripped over our own feet and stepped on each other's toes. The week before, I had danced with the instructor and discovered that dancing with a strong leader was easier and more fun. So I tried to help the process along by telling AJ how to lead. <laughs> Believe it or not, he wasn't appreciative of my advice. And it wasn't long before the instructor was back, this time suggesting a nice square dance hall down the street. <laughs> AJ and I fought that night like never before in our married life. Unexamined layers of our relationship emerged, issues of power and control, issues of dominance and submission. We talked things through and decided we wanted to learn to dance together, literally and metaphorically. We wanted to dance together on the dance floor and in our relationship. We stuck it out. We learned to dance together. Over the years, as I've reflected on those fateful dance lessons, I've begun to see that within the form of dance we chose to learn, there are some deeply embedded cultural assumptions about who is authorized to lead and who is expected to follow. Authority was assigned according to patriarchal norms and a gender binary. Swing dance came out of the jazz movement of the 1920s in the African-American community of West Harlem. It was then Europeanized in Arthur Miller dance studios across the country. Male-identified people led female-identified people, and the female-identified people followed. The idea of men dancing with men or women dancing with women would have been unthinkable in that setting. Trans and non-binary folks would have been welcome only to the extent they could pass as one gender or the other. Yet those norms went unchallenged, accepted as just the way things were. And speaking of dance, there's a YouTube video that makes its way around social media periodically. It's of a young man dancing at an open air concert. Bare chested with long hair flowing, he dances with abandon by himself in the middle of a large field. 
Another person comes to join him, but joins in only momentarily, and then you can almost feel his embarrassment as he went to sit back down in the grass. A few minutes pass before another brave soul comes and dances next to the young man. Another couple minutes pass and someone else joins them. Soon there were four dancers, then eight, and then the original lone dancer was indistinguishable from the crowd that formed around him. No one had granted him to the, author the authority to lead, but it subsequently did come from those who followed. Richard Rohr notes that when people become frightened and insecure, there is a tendency to look for sources of authority as a means to reduce anxiety. Rohr says, the fundamentalist is nothing more, is more than anything, one who believes that all problems can be resolved by an appeal to authority. My friends, we live at a time of increased fear, insecurity, and a rising authoritarian, authoritarianism, which calls for strict obedience to authority at the expense, too often, of personal freedom. Rohr offers an alternative, which is the cultivation of an inner life and a faith journey, looking within to find where it is that we can place our faith and trust, which points to the reason that we do the dance of authority in our Unitarian Universalist congregations. It's not about the dance. It's about these gathered communities that we create, communities called together in the spirit of covenant, the sacred promises we make to one another to dance together with a spirit of love. A covenant which Unitarian Universalist Association President, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray says, is life-giving, life-affirming, and justice-centered. By sharing leadership, stepping up and stepping back, sometimes leading and sometimes following, we hold our authority lightly and with a degree of humility. We share it with each other. When we open the way for new leaders among us to emerge, it is more likely that, we, that the way things are and the way things have been will be questioned and challenged, which is as it should be and especially when we grant authority of leadership to the wide diversity of people among us, people of all ages, people of all class backgrounds, people of all gender identities, racial and ethnic identities, all sexual orientations, people with disabilities, people with different religious backgrounds and faith perspectives, all can be called to lead. We need all to see all of what must be seen and to do all of what must be done. Our religious ancestors who authored the Cambridge Platform were able to free themselves from the, the oppressive authority of the Church of England, which restricted religious freedom. They set in motion the congregational way that we have become accustomed to. Now, nearly 400 years later, we are working to free ourselves from oppressive societal and cultural norms that work to uphold unjust ways of assigning authority and deciding who should lead who should follow 
and who even gets to be a part of the dance. The congregational way is taking responsibility for our shared life in community, developing a rich inner life, discerning a way forward, a journey of faith. The dance we do is a circle dance, every round a generation. Does my heart so much good to see generational families here. Every round, a generation, on and on the circles moving, changing and shaping what is yet to come. Let it be a dance we do, lead or follow, but always dance. May it be so, amen, and blessed be. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in singing our closing hymn, number 311 in the gray hymnal, Let It Be a Dance. We're going to sing it top to bottom three times through. Let it be a dance we do. May I have this dance with you. remain standing for our chalice extinguishing.
The words to the cellist extinguishing are written by Elizabeth Sell Jones, and you should all know them if you've been here before. May we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, nor the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I leave you with words that were written by Kathleen McTeague. May the light around us guide our footsteps and hold us fast to the best and most righteous we seek. May the darkness around us nurture our dreams so that we may give us rest and give ourselves to the work of the world. Let us seek to remember the wholeness of our lives, the weaving of light and shadow in this great and astonishing dance in which we move. The service has ended. May our service to the world continue renewed. Please do plan on coming back in 15 minutes to talk about the future of music. Go in love. Go in peace. <laughs>